pretty similar themes. The subject is same. Uh, of course, um, the the time distance is too much. Difference is too much. Now, the second thing I wanted to start with is that how in India we talk about uh, musical traditions, but people who were actually involved with making of the music in the folk systems are generally missed out and not remembered so much. So we have these selected three percussion instruments that are there from Nandlal Bose's posters. You have uh, very peculiar styles of instruments that are there. And we have this from the National Museum collection. This can, this presentation is like uh, you know how NGMA and NM are soulmates, although distanced in time, because the collection has the same sort of resonance. If you actually look closely, and um, it's uh, there is not much written because the visuals are speaking, especially the first one. If you look at the style of the drumming the percussionist is doing, and you compare it to the Gupta period um, sculpture that is doing the same. And probably, I don't know, because one of the hands is broken, if probably later period works could be used to understand the broken parts of the ancient sculptures. This can uh, be a tool and eight. Um, so we have these. Exact, it's like a carbon copy that's there. And then we have musicians that would sort of ornate and decorate the court with their oral traditions of music and <clears throat> playing. And we have these from the Nandan Bose's collection. And then we have the sculptural representation of the court dancers that would have sung and danced in the glory of either the king or the deity at festivals and presentations. Yes, so that and this one is 2nd century BC, so it's actually 200 years before Christ. And this is 1937 that we are looking at. Because the, the feel and the whole thing is so similar that there will be points where I'll be pinching you to look at the timeline and the difference and the renderings that are happening. Here, this is a much later uh, thing from the National Museum, which is of the 19th century, that shows people who would work in the uh, coin mints in order to make <coughs> the coin and we have a similar repro uh, not reproduction, similar style uh, that's there where we see a, um, a smith who's trying to make shape out of um, iron. Now after having gone through the first phase of how curators work, we work with visual resemblance, the second aspect is that visual is not enough. If visual was enough, there wouldn't have been art discourses and art theories and art philosophy and aesthetics and so on and so forth. So of course there is something more that we need to push for. And the second part of my presentation I call Beyond the Visual, where we try and look at how the extended meanings function, how do they live, how are they transferred, how do they amplify, and so on and so forth. Not reading the whole text, but uh, right into the image. Uh, here we have a mother who is breastfeeding the child, and this is 5,000 years old in India. We see the same in Nandan Bose's posters. These, till this time it would have been a visual similarity, but we are pushing a little more and we are looking at what UNICEF and WHO talks about much, much later when what they do with their posters because we have done this in our plastic art 5,000 years ago and it's reoccurred in Nandlal Bose's uh, posters, so it is quite a prominent thing. And then what's interesting is that how visual, which is... I have a photo now. So how a visual which is like this 5,000 years ago becomes a logo. So it's also the journey, the concept 
and the journey that a visual takes from being an expression, a thought, a concept. And finally, that's understood. We go to the malls now and we see a logo like this and it's understood that it's for that. And uh, we were perhaps promoting this in India 5,000 years ago with our plastic arts. Uh, I am in Karnataka, so I have to pay the homage to the land. I thought, let me shift a little bit of, you know, digression from what the museums hold to what the sites can hold. Uh, you have uh, a very important site called Badami, which is actually 6th to 8th century. And since now we are looking at what happens beyond the visuals, one was how concept can turn into an image and a logo. And here what we see, this is an image of Krishna lifting the Govardhan. And uh, what art historians actually do, let me take you into that a bit. And mostly this would be understood as Krishna lifting the Govardhan because he is in the center, iconometrically he is bigger, he is larger. That's what people would worship. But if you look closely, what you see at the back is you see people churning the uh, butter. Can I have tried to zoom in. It's a little, it's not in the best of the conditions, but of course we can make out that the churning of the butter is going on. And how art historians actually read the visuals is fascinating. Now there was this whole thing of, we know that Krishna lifted the Govardhan Parvat for quite many days, but we don't know how many days. We don't know whether any artist attempted to show those number of particular days, like, you know, third day of holding in the mountain, fifth day of holding the mountain, so on and so forth. But as soon as you see people churning, churning of the butter cannot happen immediately. The milk has to be brought, it has to be turned into curd. From the curd, the butter will come. So it's almost three to four days. So a lot of times art historians would look at images and activities that are going on in the periphery to understand how time has been shown by the Indian artists just by chiseling on the rocks and stones. So the third day, or the fourth day, and uh, there is actually an art historian, big, big stalwart, Sri, um, Sri Shivramurti, Dr. Shivramurti, who reads it. So it's not my reading, but it's come to us in legacy of art history. So you have this where he says that this is perhaps the third or the fourth day that this is happening. And then there is many, <clears throat> there is much more discourse that goes on around this because you talk about how there were women who understood economics perhaps better than men, if I can say, because they knew that if their husbands as milkmen are doing the job of uh, milking the cows, how could they increase the shelf life of the milk? Because it would go bad very soon. So one way was to make it into curd, it would sustain for longer, and you make it for butter, even longer, you turn it into ghee, even longer. As the shelf life increases, the price would increase. But that's for another talk someday where I talk about this, how these little bit of, you know, evidences you find in how women were taking forth the economy and not really registered much anywhere. Okay, so we have this from Nanvad Bose's uh, uh, poster collection where you have milking as well as the churning going on. And uh, yeah, so it's not really about the visual, but how you see the extended meaning of that visual. Now, the third thing is that when we talk about labor, skill, profession, and we look at the ancient arts, I put up this example because this is an example I have worked with in the National Museum. So back to the museum now. Uh, this is the example that I have worked with at the National Museum where, uh, you know, when you start understanding the skill, profession and uh, the, the work, the toiling that's going on and you decide to register that object as per the profession. Now, what we have here is uh, from Maharashtra, this uh, yaksha figure called the Pitakura yaksha because it comes from that site. 
and again 2nd century BCE. So something very interesting happens that an artwork is generally in its context, it's decontextualized as soon as it's brought to the museum and the job of the curator then becomes to recontextualize in order to do some justice to you know the fact that it's been brought there. And what we have here, so let me just take you to Maharashtra for a quick tour. So you have the rock cut caves that are there and it is at cave number three, which is here, the, uh, the longish cave that you see. It was outside in the debris that this particular yaksha was found. And uh, this is what the caves look like from outside and this is from uh, the ASI collection, the photograph and they were documenting it. And uh, this is how they photographed it, they understood it and then it was finally brought to the National Museum. And considering that it's a very prime piece because it looked very fine and it was from Maharashtra, Pitalkura is one of the most intriguing, interesting sites to look at. It was placed near the reception area of the National Museum so that before and while people would buy the tickets, people would be admiring this Yaksha figure. And then coming back to the topic that we are discussing today, something happened that we started, it was noticed that it has this inscription and people had, at ASI had already noticed it. Uh, Dr. M. N. Deshpande is the one who found this particular um, artifact from there. So when you read the inscription, it says Kannadasen Hirankarin Kato, which means Kannadas, who is a goldsmith, has carved this sculpture. So, as soon as you read this, it, you know, dips you into this ocean of what all was happening professionally in this country 200 years before Christ, where people were not only so proficient that they could put their names with what they were doing, but also they were interdisciplinary. So, someone who was carving, who was working on some soft metal like gold was also doing work on granite on hard stones like this and proudly proclaiming it that you know and confessing that you know this is this is my confession this is my work this is my profession and things like that so we read this uh, re-read this inscription and uh, with the help of my director general who's also an archaeologist we decided that the most suitable place for this particular sculpture would be the jewelry gallery at the national museum because it would be the perfect ode for the goldsmiths, for us to have known the name of a goldsmith from 200 years, like 2nd century BC is a very, very big finding. So this is how sometimes when we register the skill, when we register the professions, the laborious work that's, that's made that piece, it helps us to curate better in the museum spaces. Now, um, just for the visual trigger and pleasure of it, I think it would be nice if I can take you through like a phase-wise period of how these little things at places show people working and toiling and doing their profession and skill in sweat and blood. So very quickly, um, you have the tiller of the soil, writer, um, chauri bearer, carpenter and a gardener from the NGMA collection and back to the farmer that I was talking about. I have put a question mark because it's always a debate whether we call it a farmer or not. People are head over heels that it is not a farmer, some people say it is. But going by the visual that we are able to see, it's, I think it's a safe reading for now. Um, this is again from 2500 BC. It's, our registers call it toy cart, but I thought to go with cart puller because that's what we are talking about today of people engaged in their hardships and works. So you have this, um, then we have stone carvers who are making stone carvers on stone. Um, you see the chiseling work going on. So interestingly, this piece would otherwise be read for the central panel that's there, which shows a gold ornament in the center. But if we just shift the gaze a little bit, we are also able to see things like that. And then there are people who try to read 
the whole thing of how we say that people were at some point in time wearing leaves as apparels and you see that very much happening here they are clothed in leaves uh, this is the departure of buddha when he decides to leave his house and go on this uh, journey of enlightenment and when he leaves his charioteer is shown who we forget to remember so many times had he refused his job that day we don't know if he would have had this so we have his charioteer who is who is depicted there along with the horse we have this uh, maladhars the garland bearers who are there who are you know busy in hardships of you know these heavy garlands that they would take during the temple professions during the cart temple cart profession uh, processions etc so we have this i love this smile and this figure for some reason i think this one image to show where what happens when you enjoy your work no matter what you do um yes so this panel is a very extensive panel and it's generally studied to understand how uh, when buddha was born how did uh, the saint asit came and you know he said that either he denounced the world or he's going to rule the world and things like that so there is a whole narrative thing that's going on and generally art historically what we would do is that we would i want yes so generally what generally what we would do with an image like this would be that you know art history wise i would say that okay this is a phase where buddha is not shown in his human form and symbols are used to depict him and you have him being born here so he is shown with footprints that is this sorry i touched yeah he is shown with the footprints and here he is being brought to the sage you know to say that what will he be uh in here he is shown with seven footsteps the first steps that buddha took here he is shown being born and so the panel would start like this like this and then like this so this is king who is seated and uh, buddha's mother maya devi sees a dream she sees a white elephant entering her womb and she tells it to the king i don't know if you can see here she tells it to him and then king calls the fortune tellers to interpret what the dream would have been then on the way to her father's mother's house buddha is born that's how it would be shown since he's not shown in human form he's shown by seven first steps seven steps that he took then he is brought to the yaksha and then he is presented to asi but you know when you start noticing the peripheries you notice these interesting two three figures one is a scribe that is the earliest depiction of a court scribe who would continuously be writing what's happening in the court so you have that and you also have a chori bearer the fly whisk bearer that we saw earlier Now this is a very very fascinating page. This is from Babur Nama that was painted during Akbar's period, and uh, Akbar got it made in memory of his loving grandfather. And we talk about Char Bagh and Mughal Gardens time and again and time and again. But um, we were surprised to find that they actually showed a gardener who's making the garden come alive. So you have. um the gardener there who is working and uh, i often like to compare this slide to the asha workers that are there today that help in labor with the women so you have depiction of birth of a baby where you see the baby that's been put in the forefront and then you have the mother and the female attendant who comes to assist carpenter because we saw these earlier in the slide where i had put nandlal bose's work so with all their tools etc they have been uh, put there and then the artist now uh, moving on to the next segment uh, where i talk about 
not only were people represented or thought of in that sense but some commoners i also call it presence of people that's important for any form of art that some commoners have been responsible for some of the greatest discoveries of history that have happened because it's got the the historical items were buried under the earth and they were found by chance and one such discovery is there at the national museum where we have this uh, bayana pot which is from rajasthan and these were the cow herds of a small village called kullanpur and they were playing and they stumbled upon this pot that was filled with gold coins and they were all gupta gold coins had they not found it or had they not found and reported it we would not have had this chapter in our history where we talk about varieties of gupta coins that were struck in 4th century and so i thought of bringing this pot from the national museum and putting it together with the shepherds of nanlal bose and the last segment i hope i'm on time the last segment that i deal with is how there have been moments where a laborious work has or an elaborate process has ignited some sort of philosophies that have really changed the way we look at philosophy because for a lot of time people thought that philosophy is about understanding uh, mystical things and supernatural things and metaphysics until we had some philosophers who brought the whole gamut of philosophy on the ground and they started talking about social emancipation through human rights and things like that so uh, when we talk about this we look at their choice of vocabulary how they are sometimes talking about the lengthy process that they got involved in and how they completely jolted the whole system altogether with their works now i've got a little far with these two slides where we have a person who is spinning the the wool and we have a potter but it you cannot miss kabir's poetry when you talk about potters uh, people working with the mud because he talks about that you know the god is the one who is the mud also he is the potter also he is the vessel also he is everything and he is the one who's buying it he is the one who's selling it so there is a lot of reference of pottery that comes in his poetry of course spinning of the wool is because we all know that he was into textile he was an handloom if i may use the word artist worker himself and uh, his very famous composition of jeevan chadriya we were in fact having a debate once that there are people who believe that this is not his composition uh, could have been a later edition and then some of us were trying to argue that the way he's talking about the process this cannot be someone who has never touched a handloom ever because he's talking about how first there is uh, there is fabric then the fabric goes to a dyer to get dyed then it comes back from there then how people use it he's also using metaphorical analysis for a lot of these things but for once if we do not consider the metaphysics within but just the fact that there is poetry that talks about the process of making of art and how it enables philosophy all together and uh, we have this from the national museum collection where you have kabir and ravidas sitting together you can see him working on his loom and uh, 